months have passed since the violent escalation of the Russian-Ukrainian crisis. This event sparked another in the long-running discussions on Russia's place in the modern capitalist world. Some people in the communist movement claim that Russia is not imperialist and therefore is a progressive power compared to Western imperialists. Russian elites justify their foreign policy with epic slogans about the protection of the Russian language and the Russian world, about the secret mission for saving Europe, exhorting the restoration of historical justice, or even reuniting fragmented lands. At the same time, the Russian elite accuses Western countries of economic expansion into their sacred and inviolable land, then denounces the unipolar American world, calling all of this the definition of the word imperialism. In the theory of Marxism-Leninism, imperialism is a strictly defined scientific concept. It not only describes the policy of the capitalist state, but also indicates its form in the system of social development. In this video, we will define imperialism from a Marxist-Leninist understanding and definitively answer the question, is Russia imperialist? In his book, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, Vladimir Lenin defines imperialism as a stage of monopolistic capital. The classic definition of imperialism is found in the following. Imperialism is capitalism at that stage of development at which the dominance of monopolies and finance capital is established, in which the export of capital has acquired pronounced importance, in which the division of the world among the international trusts has begun, in which the division of all territories of the globe among the biggest capitalist powers has been completed. Moreover, Imperialism emerged in the late 19th, early 20th centuries as a result of the objective development of capitalist relations in which free competition, characteristic of early and mature bourgeois society, is dialectically replaced by the domination of monopolies. The most striking example of an imperialist state during this period was the British Empire, which colonized most of the territory of the globe. Along with it, there was a scattering of other imperialist countries, for example, France, Germany, Japan which pursued an imperialist policy on a more limited scale. However, an imperialist state is not always a huge colonial empire. At the beginning of the 20th century, the imperialist state also included the Russian Empire, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and the Italian Kingdom. There is competition between a huge colonial power and relatively small imperialist states, which can take place both in a relatively peaceful way, but can also turn into a form of war. It was the competition of national monopolies and the desire to redistribute spheres of influence in the world that would become the main reason for World War I. The key features of imperialism include, firstly, the concentration of production and capital, which has reached such a high stage of development that it has created monopolies which play a decisive role in economic life. Secondly, the merger of banking capital with industrial capital and a creation of a financial oligarchy on the basis of this financial capital. Thirdly, the export of capital, which becomes more important than the export of goods. Fourth, the formation of international monopolistic unions of capitalists dividing the world. Fifth, the participation of the largest capitalist powers in the territorial redistribution of the world. Having considered the essence and highlighted the key features of imperialism, we can proceed to the question, why is the Russian Federation an imperialist state? As one of the main tasks in achieving economic security for the Russian Federation, the Russian National Security Strategy highlights the support, development, and protection of competition in the Russian market, suppression of monopolistic activities and anti-competitive agreements, ensuring equal conditions and freedom of economic activity on the territory of the Russian Federation. Despite this, the Russian economy is in fact monopolistic. An accurate assessment of the share of domestic monopolies in the structure of the state's GDP is difficult at the moment but it may well be more than 70%. Thus, in the retail sector, the X5 Retail Group PC and Magnet OJSC retail chains occupy a monopoly position, which has repeatedly led to collusion between them. In the oil refining sector, 11 oil and gas companies, Rosneft, Lukoil, Gazprom, Neft, and others provide more than 95% of total production. The Russian telecommunications market has long been divided among the big four MTS PJSC, Megaphone PJSC, Beeline, Tele2 LLC. As for the financial sector, even the Central Bank of Russia in its 2018 analytical report stated that the Russian banking sector is a monopoly or oligopoly with a competitive environment. In particular, for lending and individual deposits, 
Sparebank is among the leading players in 83 out of 85 regions of the country, and VTB is in 68. In lending and raising funds for organizations, Spare occupies a leading position in 82 subjects and VTB in 61. In addition, other big banks, Gazprom Bank, Rosiljos Bank, play a significant role in providing these services. In the work on the foundations of Leninism, Joseph Stalin wrote, Imperialism is the omnipotence of monopolistic trusts and syndicates, banks and financial oligarchies in industrial countries. The economic activity of the so-called natural monopolies in Russian territory deserves special attention. With the light hand of bourgeois theoretical economists, John Stuart Mill, J.W. Bommel, etc., natural monopoly is recognized as a good monopoly. That is, a form of organization of economic activity that serves the public interest, as opposed to an artificial or bad monopoly that serves the interests of private owners. However, according to Marxist theory, there are no good or bad monopolies. In fact, monopolies differ from each other only in the degree of their influence on state bodies, which supposedly carry out the function of regulating economic activity, while they actually play a formal role in the anarchy of capitalist production. This is exactly what role in the control of economic activity is played by the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service. Thus, the Russian economy is monopolistic in nature. This is because the main role in the economy is played not by small and medium-sized businesses, but by large ones that use their dominant position to maximize their profits. Moreover, the process of monopolization of the economy is not subjective, it's an objective process of the development of capitalist relations. The process of turning an economy with a free market and pure competition into a monopolistic one does not depend on the subjective characteristics of some individuals. It depends on the very nature of the development of social relations. In reference to the merger of banking capital with industrial capital, and the emergence of financial capital and the financial oligarchy as their basis. This process is carried out in two ways. Firstly, in the traditional way that appeared in world practice in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which was the emergence of subsidiary banks on the basis of monopolistic industrial enterprises. Examples of such financial capital in Russia are the modern Gazprom Bank, JSC, which is the daughter of Gazprom PJSC. The All-Russian Regional Development Bank, JSC, which is a daughter of Rosneft NC, PJSC. And Atkritia Bank, which is a daughter of Lukoil, PC. Secondly, through the creation of banking ecosystems, the emergence of banking ecosystems reflects a new round of development in ways to merge industrial and financial capital. Examples of such a new form of financial capital in Russia are the banking ecosystems that the banks spare. Tinkoff Bank, PJSC, VTB, which include not only banking services, but also services for housing and communal services, insurance, food delivery networks, consulting, logistics, air and railway transportation, taxis, and even the film industry. However, financial capital does not change the qualitative content of this. There is a simple replacement of one part of the economy, i.e. industrial capital, with another i.e. the service sector, which makes up the bulk of the modern economy, 55.8%. Despite the fact that representatives of the financial oligarchy put forward the motto, the customer is the center of the ecosystem, the overgrown monopolistic banking sector seeks to monopolize and commercialize all aspects of human life. It seeks to control everything by imposing a certain system of values, at the center of which is consumption, and not the creative development of the individual. The influence of domestic financial capital extends into industry. The result of the merging of banking capital and industry is the emergence of financial and industrial groups, holding companies and conglomerates, Alpha Group, Alisher Usmanov structures, etc. Russian banks are taking control of industrial companies. This happens both indirectly through lending, settlement, issuance of securities and the role of brokers, and directly through direct ownership of companies. For example, under the management of the bank's spare are the automobile company Der Weiss and Southern Automobile Group, Uralnash Zavod, and United Machine Building Plant, which are under the management of Gazprom Bank, JSC. The export of capital is an integral property of the imperialist state, a logical consequence of the monopolization of its economy and the emergence of financial capital within it. This indicator shows that financial surpluses arise in some economies, 
i.e. financial capital becomes cramped within the borders of its own country, and it seeks to invest these funds in various forms in the economy of other countries, hoping to receive dividends from the export of capital. At the same time, capital outflow should be distinguished from capital flight. In the first, it is a legal form of capital movement, direct investments abroad, state lending. Then in the second, is illegal, tax evasion, money laundering. To analyze this feature of the imperialist state, let us turn to statistics. According to the World Bank data for 2019, Russia ranks 31st in the ranking of countries in terms of foreign direct investment abroad. Another important indicator reflecting the degree of penetration of state monopolistic capital into the other countries is the volume of public lending. According to this indicator, Russia already ranks 6th. The geographical distribution of Russian investments is quite diverse. Countries of the former Soviet Union, Syria, Venezuela, Bolivia, Central Africa, and others. Of course, in terms of its size and weight in global financial flows, the outflow of capital from Russia is significantly inferior to a number of imperialist states. The objective consequence of the export of capital from the country is the expansion of monopolies abroad. For example, the share of the transnational monopoly Gazprom in gas supplies to Europe for 2019 was 41.1%. Along with Gazprom, other domestic monopolies such as Rasneft, Lukoil, Uralkali, Nikel, all play an important role in the international energy market. Another monopolist is the manufacturer of agricultural machinery, the Rastelmash group of companies, which supplies products to 50 countries and its service network includes more than 500 facilities in different countries of the world. At the same time, the share of Rastel Mash in the world market of harvesting agricultural machinery is 17%. The expansion of domestic monopolies into foreign markets is not limited to the raw materials sector and mechanical engineering. There are domestic monopolies that have the status of international ones, which play an important role in knowledge intensive sectors of the economy. For example, the share of Roscosmos Group in the global launch services market in 2020 was 14%. Rosatom State Corporation ranks first in the world in terms of the largest portfolio of orders for the construction of nuclear power plants, largely relying on the legacy of the USSR in the military industrial complex. The Russian Federation ranks second in the world after the United States in terms of arms exports. In addition, it is worth noting that the true expansion of monopolies is not only the struggle for markets for their resources or goods, but also the struggle for the spheres of application of their capital. Examples of the latter are the expansion of Gazprom, which is characterized by the complete subordination of the gas transportation systems of foreign countries. Moreover, the latter occurs not only in a number of neighboring countries such as Belarus, Moldova, Armenia, and Kyrgyzstan, but also in such states as Hungary, Serbia, Germany, Slovakia, and others. In Africa, Alrosa is developing diamond deposits in Angola and the Congo, and state corporations such as Renova Group, Roussel, and MMC Norils Nickel are mining non-ferrous metals in South Africa, Gabon, Guinea, and Nigeria. Rosneft and Lukoil are conducting geological exploration and production of oil in Egypt, Libya, Syria, Venezuela, and Colombia. Rosatom State Corporation builds nuclear power plants and is engaged in their maintenance in Belarus, Turkey, Kazakhstan, Hungary, and other countries. Russian Railways is engaged in the modernization of railway infrastructure in North Korea. If monopolies and financial capital do not meet any resistance in the domestic market, plunging the domestic economy into the path of rotting and parasitism, then in the international arena, they face fierce competition from their foreign opponents. Pure competition for the right to exploit mineral resources and peoples develops into trade wars and is overshadowed by a tough sanctions policy and the introduction of financial and trade embargoes. The extreme form of this struggle of conflicting interests of capital has always been war. That is why the struggle of the Russian Federation against the United States for the Nord Stream 2 should be considered as a struggle for the markets of hydrocarbon resources it should be considered as a struggle between the monopolies of Gazprom, on the one hand, and Chenier Energy Incorporated, 
as well as Kinder Morgan Incorporated, on the other. The actions of the Russian Federation in Syria, or in support of the Maduro government, should be considered as a struggle for cheap oil. The struggle against fascism in Ukraine as a struggle for the market for its products, for cheap labor resources, for the possibility of exploiting its subsoil with the EU and the USA. Proceeding from this understanding, under the pretext of protecting the Russian-speaking population and opposing fascism, domestic monopolies seek to return the dominant position to their capital in the fraternal country. And this is not surprising. After all, until 2014, Ukraine was the main borrower of Russian capital. It is the protection of monopolies and their dominant position in the colonies of the near and far abroad that is the main reason for the intervention of the Russian military forces. For example, since 2014, the Wagner PMC has participated in conflicts in eastern Ukraine, Syria, Libya, overthrew unwanted rulers in the CAR, Mozambique, Mali. During the protests in 2021 in Belarus, Russia sent employees of the Rusgvardia there. During the January protests in Kazakhstan in 2022, Russia and the CSTO countries sent a limited contingent there. Thus, at the stage of imperialism, the state turns into a servant of monopolies and the financial oligarchy. The state uses diplomacy and political pressure to advance the aggressive and private property interests of the domestic bourgeoisie abroad. The state creates economic and customs unions with only one goal, to demolish borders and freely exploit its economic partners and allies. It is important that in such a situation, it is not the country or the people that seizes new territories, restores historical justice, or collects fragmented principalities of the empire, but private capital. Monopolies seize new resources, new markets for their goods, and new slaves of the capitalist regime by someone else's hands, by the hands of ordinary workers. Considering all the preceding information, it is clear that Russia is an imperialist state. The signs of the imperialist state, formulated by Vladimir Lenin in his work, Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, exactly coincide with the current state of affairs. Of course, imperialism itself has transformed over the past hundred years. New forms of capital export have appeared, and new forms of financial capital have come into existence. However, the essence has not changed. The essence of imperialism is that the era of financial capital and monopolies everywhere brings domination, ruin, and impoverishment, and not freedom, democracy, and security. The extreme form of imperialism is war, during which the financial oligarchy seeks to annex territories, thereby tossing aside the principles of national independence and self-sufficiency. What is characteristic of imperialism is that this war is always fought with the hands of ordinary people, ordinary workers. Military oppression and impoverishment fall on ordinary workers. The workers, guided by bourgeois ideology, destroy the workers. The fruits of their victory, however, always end up in the hands of monopolists and the financial oligarchy. At the same time, the increase in the impoverishment of the population, the increase in the reaction in the political space, the restriction of all freedoms are evidence of the growing contradictions in the life of society. The dialectic of social development explains that development always occurs through the struggle of contradictions, through the contradictions generated by the imperialism of the Russian Empire in October 1917, the worker state was born. Thus, imperialism is not a historical vestige or cliché from the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. Imperialism is the reality in which the modern proletariat lives. However, the laws of historical development are immutable. Sooner or later, the workers of the whole world will rise up again to fight against world imperialism and will rise up again to fight for a bright future. In order to put this into practice, it is imperative that workers study Marxist theory, fight against all forms of opportunism and revisionism, and conduct joint work on the principles of democratic centralism and strict discipline. Every worker should clearly realize that the strengthening of imperialism, the flourishing of imperialism, and its march with a broad stride around the world necessitates, first of all, the growth of the struggle of the proletariat and its victory in the end. Stay tuned.